Hey guys, your boy Chiller. Welcome back to STD Gems. Today, monumentous day. We are doing the final video that covers the functions from the algorithms library. So we've covered all this stuff and we're all the way down here. These are the functions. Let me just see if I can get them all. These are the functions we're going to be covering today. The stuff from the numeric operations. Now, we've already covered IOTA back when we covered generators, because it's really a generator, right? So we're not going to go over that one here, but we are going to cover these guys. And it looks like a lot, but a lot of them are very similar to each other, are variations. So it's actually not as much as you might think. Now, let's start with accumulate. It's, uh, it's very simple, very good place to start off with here. Uh, you give it a range of elements and it will sum them up. You have to give it a starting value. So typically you might start with, you know, zero, and then it will give you the sum of all the elements in the container. So, so you got a simple vector of ints here. You can do std c out, std accumulate, and we're going to want to do v dot begin and v dot end and then we got to give it the starting value to, to accumulate with so it should start with zero and then accumulate all these values together add them all up take the sum and then that'll be output from here so it should be a thousand and some kind of value and yeah 1068 the math checks out although i haven't done any of the math and i don't plan to so it seems fairly useful but that's only we're only getting started here uh, because we can also supply a, our own custom operations. So we can accumulate. We don't have to accumulate using a sum. We can accumulate using something else. So let's try that out. Uh, let's accumulate using the product. So we're going to find the product of all these elements together. Uh, so in that case, we got to take const. This is important. The first parameter is going to be the values that are accumulated. The second parameter is coming in from the actual container. So it's going to invoke this binary operation for every element in here. It's going to pass that element into the second parameter. The first parameter is going to be the value that is accumulated. And then the output is going to be the new value of accumulation after the operation has been done. So we want to return uh, ack times l. So if we do this, what do you expect the output to be? Place your bets in the comments down below. Were you expecting zero? Maybe, maybe if you were, if you were paying real close attention, because of course the initial value that we pass in, uh, if it's zero, it's going to be multiplied by everything in here and they're all going to get zeroed out. So for a accumulate by multiplication, you'd probably want to start off with a one, right? That seems to make a little more sense. Let's do that. And now we get negative big, big ass number. You know, a thousand times 41, 23. It's got a negative in here, so you'd expect the result to be negative. Again, the math that I haven't done at all checks out. So in this way, you can basically reduce a whole container of a bunch of values to a single value, value by, you know, applying some operation and accumulating the result. You can also think of this as like a kind of recursive operation. What we're doing is we're folding in the leftmost value into all the other values in here. And then we recursively apply that here and apply that here until there's nothing left. So we can call this, this is sometimes referred to as a left fold. You could also do a right fold could change the order um, you'd have to you know use reverse iterators but it's the same idea now if you want to get a little more creative it doesn't have to be a numeric value obviously you could use int you could use float uh, no surprises there but really you could use anything you want so std string it supports you know addition operator and add an equals operator so what we could do let's say you've got a vector of strings here and you want to just join them all together. Well, we could use accumulate for that. It's not that hard, right? Uh, what would it be? Well, we would start with an empty string and we would just accumulate from begin to end. And uh, let's see what happens when we do this. Well, we get template errors. Okay. Now what these errors are saying in way too many words is that uh, we've got a vector of std string, but our initial value that we're passing in here is a C string, basically a pointer to an array of cars. So that's no good, right? Uh, so we could just pass it an empty std string in here 
and that would get the ball rolling. Let me show you a, a neat way of doing that uh, using namespace std string literals. If you do that, then you can do this. You can make your uh, your literals actual strings instead of C strings that have to get converted to uh, std string. So you can do that if you like or not. I don't care, but this should build now. It does build, and when we run it, we get concatenation of everything in that array. So you can see here, not just, even though the header name is numeric, it's not just numeric things that this stuff can work on, it can work on anything as long as it uh, supports the operators or the operations that are being called on the things. Obviously, it can also work on your own custom classes. Anytime you need to accumulate some result that is going to be run over an entire container of things or reduce them all down to a single thing, std accumulate can be a very nice tool for your toolbox. One thing to note about the operation that you use, uh, it's not allowed to invalidate any iterators and it's not allowed to modify the elements of the range. Just something to keep in mind if you do that, you're not guaranteed to have things work out in your favor. Let's just put it that way. Okay, so accumulate, one down, bunch more to go. What's the next one? Inner product. What's it gonna do? Uh, well, we see here, we're taking in two input ranges, uh, and we again, we have a, uh, a starting value, initial. Uh, this one actually has two binary operations if you supply custom operations. So there's two operations being applied, there's two ranges. Hmm, seems complicated, but really it's not that complicated at all. So within a product you got two ranges. What you're going to do is for each of these matching elements, elements at the same, well let's say index, what you're going to do is you're going to perform an operation between the two, and by default, it's going to be the product. It's in the name there, right? Inner product. So you're going to multiply the first element of the first range with the first element of the second range, second element of the first range, second element, second range, so on and so forth. Then once you have that result, you're going to accumulate all of those results together and reduce them down into a single. So the second part here is basically the same as accumulate up here only you're also performing an operation between parallel elements in two different ranges as the first step. So you can think of the first step here as like a std transform, and then the second step is a uh, std accumulate. So let's try it out here. We got these two ranges here. We're going to multiply them, and then we're going to accumulate those results together. We're going to start off again, the accumulation of zero. So what do we expect? Well, it's going to be two plus eight, plus 24. So if my quick maths is working out, that should be 34. And we get 34. Nothing could be simpler, right? And again, you can supply your own custom operators, operations here, to do other things instead of multiply and then add, um, or to support types other than, you know, int and float. Like, let's say instead of multiplying and then adding, what if we wanted to subtract and then multiply. Well, we could do std minus followed by std, and that's just multiplies. So the operation, the parallel operation between the two ranges is going to be subtraction followed by an accumulation by multiplication. And that gives us negative 34, which, uh, I don't know, sounds plausible at least to me. The main takeaway here is that whenever you have some operation where you're going to be doing a uh, basically a std transform parallel op operation in two ranges followed by a reduction to a single value, um, you can use std inner product to uh, do that very nicely. The only thing I don't like about using std inner product for things that aren't very mathy is the name. The name is very misleading, right? It, if you're not actually, you know... Alright, moving on. Adjacent difference. So what's this one? Well, this one's a little different than the other two that we had so far. Uh, these two, accumulated inner product, it did not have an execution policy version. But this one does have execution policy versions. But we're going to ignore them like we've ignored the, all the other ones up until now. And we'll, we'll discuss why some have execution policy versions and others do not in the next video. Uh, but in this video, we're just going to ignore that. 
And the normal versions, they, they look pretty usual. It takes in a single range. Uh, but this one outputs to a range, so it doesn't reduce down to a single value. Adjacent difference also outputs a range of values. And it applies a single operation that you can supply a custom version of if you like. Uh, the default is going to be subtraction. So what is adjacent difference? These operations, there it's very nice to, uh, to, to view them as a diagram visually, and they make a lot more sense. You know, accumulate, or you're running over a range and you're reducing it down to a single value. In a product, two ranges, doing parallel operations, and then reducing those results down to a single value. So the adjacent difference, what you're doing is you're applying an operation between adjacent elements in the input range. So between these two, you're doing an operation, which by uh, default is a difference, subtraction, and then you store the result here, here. Because of the way this adjacency works, it doesn't wrap around, so you have less results than you did have inputs. So this first one here is just a, it just copies the first value from here into here. So we're gonna calculate that, it's not a big deal. Input vector, output vector, we're gonna use std back inserter to insert into the output range there. And we're going to write all those values to C out. And you get 1, 1, 1, 4, 1, negative 3. Seems to match up, right? First value is just copied over. Second one is the difference is 2 minus 1. That's 1. 3 minus 2. That's 1. 7 minus 3 is 4. 8 minus 7 is 1. 5 minus 8, negative 3. There you go. You want to perform some operation between adjacent elements in a range. Adjacent difference has got your back. All right, one last one here, partial sum, and then it's going to be very smooth sailing for a reason that you will very soon uh, understand. So partial sum, what's this guy going to do? Computes the partial sums of elements and sub-ranges of the range first to the last and writes them to the range beginning at D first. All right, so this one's going to take in a range as an input and it's also going to output a range. So it does not reduce down to a single value, only has a single binary operation. So it seems quite similar to adjacent differences, but the output is uh, not really similar at all. This one's actually very similar to accumulate, only instead of reducing down to a single value, it retains all of the intermediate values. So we can see here in the output, uh, for the first one, the output is just the, the first input value. For the second one, the output is the first input plus the second input, and then the first plus the second plus the third. So it's a running accumulation. Does that make sense? I don't know. Let's, uh, let's just try it out. So we do partial sum, and I believe it will just work out of the box like this. Well, one is true, one and one, then one plus two is three, then one plus two plus three, is uh, 6, 21 plus 5, 26. So there you go, that's that's what the partial sum does. And again, like all the other guys here, you can supply your own custom binary operations to work with, you know, special types or to do things other than simply adding. And for this partial sum, or even for any of these other guys here, you might be saying, I don't really see where I could use it. I mean, I think everyone can see the value of accumulate. That one should be a no-brainer. But these other ones, you might you might be saying, hey, I don't know if I'll ever find a use for them. But uh, it does come up, trust me. Uh, I have actually used partial sum to solve an algorithm problem, or at least to help solving an algorithm problem in a more efficient manner. And I mean, again, I could have done it manually with just a loop, but it's a lot cleaner if you, uh, if you deploy these numeric operations when they actually fit. But the only way you can do that is if you're actually aware of them. So that's why I'm throwing this out here. They're not, they're not something that you're going to be reaching for, you know, every day. But it's nice to have them somewhere in the back of your mind, especially if you're doing things more algorithmically inclined. So I said these guys here now are going to be smooth sailing. Why is that? Well, you can probably take a guess if you've been listening to the words I've been using. Remember, when I said, when I was talking about accumulate, I said it takes a range of values and it reduces it down to a single value. Well, guess what? That is exactly what reduce does as well. In fact, let me just uh, quickly show you something. So I've got this range here. I'm going to accumulate over the entire range and output the result. We can see it's 26. All right. Now I am going to just replace this with reduce. Also 26. So that's a pretty big hint that perhaps they're doing the same thing. And they are doing, they're almost exactly the same. 
you give them an input range, it reduces it down to a single value. You supply an initial value in here. You can also supply a custom binary operation. One nice thing that reduce has that uh, accumulate doesn't have is you don't even have to supply an initial value. If you don't supply one, it will default construct an initial value for you. So you might be saying, well, if they're so similar, why do we have both of them? Why don't we just, you know, live with only accumulate or only reduce? And the answer is there is one key difference between accumulate and reduce. Accumulate guarantees that this order of accumulation will go from left to right like this. Reduce makes no such guarantee. The order of accumulation could go in the opposite direction or it could happen in groups. Like for example, um, reduce could split it up. It could accumulate these three into one value, accumulate these three into another value in a different order, and then accumulate these two together to get the final, kind of like a divide and conquer. So because you're not guaranteed to get this uh, exact ordering and sequencing, well, that's the key difference between accumulate and reduce. And there's a reason why um, that is desirable. And now we're gonna go into that in the next video, but just one little hint here, you notice accumulate, uh, it has strict ordering, it doesn't have execution policy. Whereas reduce has versions that take an execution policy. And if you know anything about execution policies, they're all about uh, making things parallel. So by relaxing the strict condition that things must be in order, maybe that allows you to do some stuff with parallelization. And exclusive scan and inclusive scan, you can see they just do a std partial sum, only where partial sum was also has a strict ordering. Exclusive and inclusive scan do not have that strict ordering, and so they too take execution policies. We can see here that the, uh, the main difference between exclusive and inclusive scan is whether or not it includes the ith element from the ith sum. So what that means is, you know, if it's inclusive, you're going to be like 1, 3, 6, 10. If it's exclusive, you're going to be 0, 1, 3, 6. Just to prove I'm not full of scat here, inclusive scan, 1, 3, 6, 10. But we can also do exclusive scan. Interesting thing with exclusive scan is you have to provide it with an initial value to start the ball rolling. So if we start off with a 0, we get 0, 1, 3, 6. Just like Chili's showing you. And again, that's another little difference here between uh, inclusive, exclusive scan and partial sum. Partial sum does ne never takes an initial value. Inclusive scan, the, the first overload doesn't take an initial value, but other overloads are allowed to take an initial value. So it's optional, but you can supply an initial value for inclusive scan. And exclusive scan always takes an initial value. Then we have transform reduce. This one's a little tricky. There's actually a couple different modes. There's a mode where you input a single range. It's going to perform a unary operation on all the elements in that range, and then it is going to reduce them. So this version is like accumulate or reduce, except you can also provide a transformation before you do the reduction. Whereas this version here, which takes two ranges, it's more like, uh, whatchamacallit, uh, inner product. So this is like an out of order inner product. And this one is something new. You can do a, a transform plus a reduce or accumulate if you like. So what I'm guessing this one is, is this one is just the out of order version of inner product. Let's see here. Yeah, effectively a parallelized version of a std inner product. Okay, so there you go. So, so this one is basically just this one, except it uses uh, std plus and std multiplies which uh, yeah, would give you inner product. All right, so transform reduce seems uh, very useful. And then transform exclusive scan and uh, inclusive scan is, you know, it's the same as exclusive scan and inclusive scan, except that you can also apply a transformation before you do the scan accumulate. So this one again, just like inclusive and exclusive scan, it works on a single range, uh, but it just allows you to also apply a transformation operation before you do that accumulation. So basically, like I said, these guys are just variations of these guys up here. The main thing being, these guys 
they don't guarantee an ordering, right? And that is what enables uh, execution policies and what enables them to be parallelized, which again, we're going to talk about in more depth in the next video. One thing you might be wondering is, well, what about adjacent difference, Chili? I mean, this one starts off with execution policies uh, and it doesn't have a counterpart in here. Well, that makes sense, right? Because when you think about it, with adjacent differences, it's not like inner product or accumulate or partial sum where there is some kind of result that's being built up and all of these depend on each other. With adjacent difference, these operations are all independent of each other, right? The result of this operation here has no dependency on, you know, the result of this operation here or vice versa. They're completely independent. They're already parallel. They're already, it they doesn't matter what order they happen in. And that's why adjacent difference was able to just have the execution policy version added to it in C++17. We didn't need to add a new version down here for it. So it's a, it's a little bit of a special case, a special boy. But yeah, here's the numeric operations. Like I said, they can come in handy sometimes. If they fit, it's a good idea to use them. They're very expressive. They'll make your code shorter and cleaner. But, um, you know, don't turn yourself into a pretzel trying to solve problems using these guys. If it doesn't fit, just forget about it. Write a loop. And hopefully, this has also, just a little bit, wet your appetite for execution policy. Because that's going to be, like I said, the topic of the next video. We've been every, many, many of these guys in here, uh, they support execution policies, meaning that with just by adding a single parameter to the function call, we're able to run these on parallel and multiple cores on our CPU, just automatically. It's beautiful. So uh, in the next video, we're going to show how to do that, which is actually very easy. And we're going to show when you can and when you cannot do that, which is a little more complicated. But until then, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please click the like button. It helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more STD gems. Mm -hmm.